it's brilliant to have you on the You're Not A Frog podcast. Uh, for those people that don't know who you are, just introduce yourself for us. Okay, so Dyke Drummond, I'm a family doc from uh, Seattle, Washington in the United States of America. But I, I did live in England as a schoolboy for three and a half years and have a handful of O-levels <laughs> and learned how to play rugby and drink warm beer. And what we're doing is we're co-recording our podcast here. So this is Dyke Drummond with the latest edition of the Physicians on Purpose podcast coming at you from both sides of the pond, Seattle, Washington, and England, the, the National Health Service in England. And uh, Rachel and I are recording together here. Rachel, give your little intro. Let's hear it. Yes, yeah, so I'm Rachel. I, I'm a former GP. I host the You Are Not A Frog podcast. I specialize in resilience uh, in the workplace for doctors and other professionals in high-stress jobs. And yeah, my aim is to, quite a grand aim, to, to save the NHS by basically stopping people leaving. <laughs> oh, nice. Yes. Nice. Well, my, my goal is to is, is two-part two part to give individual physicians, nurses, other people who work in healthcare, anybody whose programming is the patient comes first, the tools to be able to recognize and prevent burnout in themselves and others. And then in the organizations that employ these people to give those leaders who have the capacity to create the context and the environment in which people work, give them the tools in order to build a functional organizational coal mine we got canaries and coal mines, coal mine burnout prevention strategy. And so we were both sides of that equation. Mm. And I, I love your analogy about the canary and the coal mine. Just, just describe that to us because I think it's really powerful. Well, it's a coal mine analogy. Everybody in the north of England would understand it, right? But if you, if you go back to the, to the time before we had digital air quality indicators, um, mining was very dangerous, at least in part, is because in a coal seam, and a coal seam might be 15 feet high, and they're jackhammering into that coal seam, there's bubbles. Um, and the bubbles contain one of three gases, uh, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and methane. And in their natural state, those gases are odorless and colorless. And so people would die in the mine when a, when a jackhammer would hammer into one of these big bubbles, the gas would come out of the face and people would just drop. So what they ended up figuring out is that canaries Two things. A male canary never stops singing because he's always looking for a mate. And if you put him in a little cage and take him down in the mine, he'll be tweeting away while you're working. All you had to do is stop every once in a while and make sure the bird's okay, because canaries also die in bad air before humans. So what they would do, and if you Google canary in a coal mine, you'll see a picture of a dirty face miner with a little canary in a little cage. What they would do is stop every once in a while and make sure the bird's still singing. Birds sing and they go back to work. But if the bird's not singing, they check the bird, birds down, everybody drops their tools and runs for the top, gets in the elevator and gets out of the shaft because there's bad air down there. And it's, it's kind of cute, but I even have seen little canary resuscitation devices because oh. if your canary saved your life, you didn't want to leave them down in the mine. You'd bring a little, a little gas mask for a canary. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Nigel, <laughs> Nigel, Nigel, don't leave Nigel in the shaft. <laughs> Poor old canary. And what I like about your analogy is I, I've heard you talking about the fact that the, the physicians, the doctors are the canaries of the health service. That right. Well, you've got people working in stressful circumstances. Now, it's not the kind of physical stress that you see in a coal mine, but what you have is a context, a mine. And you've got people in the mine who've always shown stress because since the beginning of measurements of burnout, physicians, nurses, anybody, again, whose programming is the patient comes first, show a higher rate of burnout prevalence, a higher rate of suicide, all of those kind of things. It's stressful to do what we do because we chose a long time ago to put ourselves in the path of danger, meaning we're going to be with our patients at a time when Emotions are strongly positive on occasion, but almost always we're going to be there when they're strongly negative, when people are sick, hurting, scared, and dying. And so if we're putting those same people who are sick, hurting, scared, and dying as, as they come first ahead of us, the threat of overextending yourself is constant. And so if I see in America, we just did a survey that came out about three months ago now. We're here now in March 16th of 2023 recording this. It was a survey that's been done by Shannon Felt and the whole gang, the cabal that does all this research, right? It had been done in 2011, 2014, 2017, and 2021. And the latest survey shows a prevalence, 
And by prevalence, I mean, it's a snapshot. The day the survey was administered, 63% of the doctors who took it were suffering from at least one symptom of burnout. So if we've got 63% burnout prevalence on any given day, and we know that burnout affects quality, safety, patient satisfaction, engagement, retention, all of that kind of stuff, and I'm pretty sure it's not any different in the NHS, what's happening is 60% of your doctors are bringing their C game to work every day. And you could forgive your mother if she read these statistics, and, and most of the time they're, the lay press doesn't know them, but you could blame your mother if she said, I'm going to go see the doctor today, but it's just a coin toss on whether I'm going to get good care. She could feel that way, and it's probably true. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to know what's happening in the, in the U.S. at the moment. I mean, that is, that is happening in the NHS. And I, I, I'm not sure it's because the patients think, well, I'm not going to get good care if I get to the doctor. But actually, at the moment, they, they, a lot of them are actually struggling to get to the doctor because... I guess one of the main differences between our system and yours is that we in the NHS are expected to sue everybody. It's free at the point of need and there is no cap on the amount of people that can expect to have treatments. Unfortunately, the number of doctors is going down because lots and lots of people are burning out and leaving. And so people are having to wait an enormous amount of time quite often now for um, outpatient treatment, for operations and GPs are fully open. They are offering appointments and stuff, but some practices are working at, you know, a third of the capacity of, of the doctors. And, and so the patients are, you know, quite rightly getting upset about this. But it's not the doctor's fault, obviously. But right. we just got this massive staffing crisis and the NHS isn't coping. I always think it's a bit like a big sponge because... Uh, I think healthcare professionals, you just absorb the extra work over the years, don't you? You absorb it and you absorb it. But now our sponge is just completely sodden. We can't absorb anything more. And then it, it overspills. And for us, it overspills into the emergency department. So suddenly they're not coping anymore because they just have too many people that aren't going to see their GP, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, is that what you're seeing in the US at the moment or is it a bit different? Well, hang on a second. I want to ask you a quick question to follow on there. Mm. Isn't there a strike going on right now? Yeah. Yeah, there is. Who's striking? Well, I don't know all the facts because I, I'm not following the news very um, closely. Everyone seems to be striking in the UK at the moment. The, the train drivers, the teachers, the junior doctors are striking about pay. Um, the nurses um, have been striking. People are being asked to do an impossible job. And so for people to actually agree to do what is impossible is just sort of <coughs> nonsensical. And yeah, so there's a lot of striking. I, I think the problem is it, it, it's about being valued and it's a, about actually being able to do a good job because that, that's one of the main problems. If you can't do the job that you want to be able to do because of time, capacity, resources, you end up just firefighting constantly, don't you? And, and nobody likes working like that. And no one likes to feel that they're doing a bad job. And if you're sort of operating you, in the UK at the moment, the amount of patient contacts that GPs are expected to have in a day is, is massive. I think there's been some right. research, I don't know if you'll probably know better than me about the amount of patient contacts that is safe in a day. And it is certainly not 70 patient contacts. And lots of GPs are having 70, 80 patient contacts in a day, which is completely unsustainable, pretty unsafe. And there's no way you can do a fantastic job. You're just trying to, <laughs> trying to put out fires here, there and everywhere. Well, and I, I would say that, that if you're a, an American physician, you just heard her say, so she said 70, seven zero. She said 70. 70. You would, 70. So you would have in America, apart from a couple of specialties who can do the high volume. So for instance, a combined cosmetic and aesthetic, uh, excuse me, a, a combined Cosmetic and medical dermatologists with three estheticians might see 100 people a day across their practice. But a GP like me, a GP like you in our system here, if you're seeing 30 patients a day, you are flying. And the challenge here is that <clears throat> one of the challenges here and one of the main differences between NHS and America is the multi-payer system and the for-profit uh, business plans. And so what ends up happening is in America... I, as a, if I was going to try and be solo, 
I would have to have a sophisticated business office behind me that's capable of processing claims from 40 different insurance programs that don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And the insurance programs are bent on one thing, denying payment, because that's how they make their money is on what's left over. So you'll almost never get a claim paid straight up. They'll deny it. You'll have to appeal. And um, that's what limits solo practice in the States because it takes about 40 to 100 doctors to actually have enough cash flow to employ the 40 or 50 people in the business office it takes to bill every day. And you might have a 90 day, 120 day delay between the time you bill and you'll only get 70% of what you build. So when I talk to my Canadian colleagues or when I talk to the folks in the GSA, GHS that uh, NHS that have one payer, it's interesting. In the 1990s, a long time ago, somebody did a financial analysis and said, if we took the U.S. healthcare system and we simply switched from free for all of multiple insurance companies to a single payer system, if all we did was take it to single payer, how much of the expenditure on healthcare in America would vanish because we don't need the people and we don't need the profit margins of all the insurance companies. If we just went to single payer in the 1990s, that analysis said 50%. 50% of the payments of, of the flow of cash inside the American healthcare system vanishes from that one thing. But realize that 20% of our GDP goes through this healthcare system and all the insurance companies are lined up to feed the politicians money if they were at ever challenge on a single payer. Yeah. Gosh, I mean, that crazy. Is, yeah, crazy. That, that's absolutely crazy, isn't it? So, so I think there's pressures, but in, in, in a different way, um, Definitely. I mean, 30, you said 30, 30 patients, you know, we, 30 we, patients we, would call that, we would call that a quiet day, a really quiet right. day, right? That would be marvelous. If you only had to see 15 patients in your surgery, you could, you could do that. That That's manageable. But, but the thing is, if we were only doing the things we were contractually obliged to do, and I have this from the LMC, they say, you know, if, if GPs, if doctors only did do the things they were supposed to do and that they were contracted the system to do. craters. <laughs> well, A, the system would crater, but B, the doctors would be okay. But there is something stopping us from, from saying no and, and from, from working to rule. Because actually there was, a, there was a report from the House of Commons that came out um, a couple of years ago now, but it basically, it was looking into burnout in healthcare, not just physicians, but, but all, all healthcare professionals. And it actually said that the NHS only works on people doing unpaid overtime. And if people started just doing their job, the entire system would, would collapse. Um, and like I just said earlier, what we're seeing now is people are still doing the overtime, but, but once you've reached 24 hours in a day, right, you don't have any more time. And so the system is, is creaking. And I don't think I've seen it so bad, actually, ever. Well, and I can vouch for the fact that a for-profit healthcare delivery system like here in the States also, also counts on uh, the physicians showing up and doing extra work and going the extra mile because the patient comes first. So what you have is you have, in your case, it's governmental. In our case, it's business. Mm -hmm. But these are bean counting, uh, spreadsheet driven bureaucrats. And I don't know if it's like this in the NHS, but I suspect that it is. For whatever reason, they've chosen to be bureaucrats inside of a healthcare delivery system, but they've never, ever seen a doctor do the work. So I've been in front of groups of physician leaders, so like a whole room full of 50 CMOs, and I say, raise your hand if you, if you shadow your providers uh, twice a month or more. And in a room of 50 chief medical officers, I'll get one hand go up. And, and if you do that in a room of chief financial officers, the folks who are doing the accounting, no hands will go up. So what you have is an ivory tower applying business principles to a, a commitment we made as physicians and nurses that goes way beyond vocation, way beyond, way beyond paycheck. It goes, I wanted to be, I, I, I chose to go to medical school so did you. I call that the light workers fork in the road. You chose to ally your professional light to the forces of light in the universe as we battle specific forces of darkness, illness, suffering, death, dying, family members, crazed attempts to deal with those things. 
You said, I want to be a helper and a healer, and I want to make a difference. I need to have meaning and purpose, and I don't abandon my patients. And every bureaucratic, either governmental or business structure that lays on top of that devoted workforce will abuse them. Mm. Because no matter how unreasonable the workload becomes, we keep showing up. And they count on it. Yeah. So in COVID, what ended up happening was we lost a whole bunch of support staff. We lost a whole bunch of doctors. So what we've got is the doctors, especially, I, and I don't know about NHS, but certainly over here, are working with a lot less staff members to help them. So a lot less medical assistants, a lot less receptionists and things like that. But they keep showing up. Here's what that looks like on the chief financial officer's spreadsheet. Our margins just went up. Are you with me? We're seeing the same amount of patients with fewer staff. And what are the odds? You're sitting here saying, man, one of these days, it's going to get back to the good old days and I'll have my MA and I'll have my receptions. What are the odds that that chief financial officer is going to pay to staff you even to the old historical levers? Because it's going to affect the margins. So there's a huge financial disincentive to even get back to the staffing levels we had before COVID. It'll never happen. They're going to continue to run a tight ship as they always pat each other on the back in the boardroom. And, uh, and we're going to continue to overwork. You've got unions. I'm not sure that they make a difference in healthcare like they would in a coal mine. Yeah. So you guys are battling against the, um, the, the sort of financial controls all trying to make a profit. I guess what we're battling against is the, the political system, the politicians that say, well, that the NHS is sacred. Obviously, we love the NHS. You know, it's amazing. Go to any other country. You know, the fact you can waltz in, anybody be, gets treated for free. It, it's amazing. But nobody will admit, no politician will admit that it has to be limited, that it can't be uh, free and it cannot, um, and good quality and, um, cover, and completely comprehensive. That's this sort of inconsistent triad. So what happens with us is that the demand just goes up and up and up and up. And then the, the doctors, the nurses are supposed to meet the demand. And then if they burn out or, or fail or there's a problem, they're the ones that are blamed. It's not, it's not blamed on, on anything else. And one thing that, you know, I, I talk about a lot with people and it's quite difficult to get people to understand is that, you know, everybody's so, so scared of complaints and being up against the, the GMC and obviously litigation, although it's nowhere near as bad as it is, you know, over, over your side of the pond. Everyone is so concerned about complaints that it stops them saying no. It stops them putting any boundaries up. It stops them almost practicing good medicine. But what they don't realize is if they don't say no, if they just carry on and on and on, the closer they move to burnout, the more mistakes they make, the worse their consultation skills, their communication skills, their judgment starts to lapse. Some they might get stuck in a hole and get a probate issue or something. And then they're going to be up against the GMC and the complaint is going to be much, much, much worse. The, 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 uh, the problem will be much worse than just a complaint about, well, this doctor refused to do X, which wasn't in their contract anyway, and actually is good medical practice. So it's this, 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 we just don't have this realization that we are affecting the patients, we are affecting ourselves, we are causing problems by just carrying on in the, in, in the mindset that we have of, yes, you're right, the patient always comes first, which is a, a very good thing but it causes all sorts of problems when you've never been shown another way to do it i guess yeah and you and i were talking earlier about the re the relationship you have with your career mm -hmm. so here's here's the way i understand it and the way i teach it um, when you make that choice at the light workers fork in the road to go into healthcare doctor nurse doesn't matter into a position where their programming is the patient comes first, could be any one of the techs, respiratory tech, um, medical, uh, emergency medical technician, EMTs, anybody, uh, you know, just like a field medic in, in, in the armed services, right? What ends up happening is you are then submerged in an extensive training program. And that training program is meant to make you an effective physician, an effective nurse, an effective clinician to help treat diseases. But it also is a survival contest, a world-class survival contest. And one of the things you can never ask for in a training program in healthcare is 
uh, an hour to take a nap? Uh, can I go pee? How about eat lunch? That you are, you are, you are programmed to never, what I call never show weakness, meaning never do anything that would make anybody think you haven't got what it takes. And what ends up happening is people who had, uh, you know, friends and hobbies and everything in college, they go to medical school and all those things are jettisoned because it's so intense to go through the training program. So you graduate without life and you graduate with a, with a laser focus on your career. It, it's where you spend all your time. It's where you expect all your money to come from. It's where you expect all your fulfillment and satisfaction and happiness to come from. And it can't. So ideally, ideally you begin to have a logical choice about your relationship with your career. Are you a doctor 24 seven or is doctor your career and you put on your doctor hat when you go in and see patients and then you have a, a boundary, a healthy boundary that lets you take that doctor hat off and be a normal human being in your off hours. And typically somebody only learns how to have that boundary and how to have that separation when they go through their first episode of burnout. That's what burnout's here to do is to give you those boundaries in my experience, if you survive the crisis. And we have to, we have to mention that, you know, burnout has the highest and best use, but it also is a true crisis. So I try to help people avoid burnout by building in those boundaries and, and that relationship consciously in a time when they're not, you know, back against the wall, wondering how much longer they can keep going. Cause in that crisis, we lose people mm -hmm. and we don't have to, but we do. Um, but burnout can be used outside of times of crisis to build a more ideal practice and to help you practice boundaries and saying, we were talking about saying no earlier, boundaries and saying no and all those good, healthy things. Yeah. It's just a shame though, isn't it? When it, it has to take a burnout to learn those boundaries. I, I don't know many people who have learned to put in good boundaries without coming pretty darn close to, to burning out. Well, and you were mentioning it earlier, guilt and shame. It's like, hang on a second. If my programming is patient always comes first and I haven't learned how to turn that off. And now I'm contemplating doing something for myself because my back is against the wall and I'm not sure how much longer I can keep going like this. That's the little voice. I'm not sure how much longer I can keep going like this. And you start to contemplate doing things for yourself. It's guilt and shame. It's that same programming. Guilt and shame come crashing in to stop that from happening several times in a row until you're basically physiologically un incapable of continuing. Yeah. And then we have to wait until we literally can't continue because then it's, it's almost, well, it's, it's not okay, but it feels okay to then say, right, that's it. I can't do it because, because I'm, I'm burnt out. We, we did a podcast recently with Dr. Sandy Miles about this and she was talking about she'd become very ill um, and felt absolutely terrible uh, because she couldn't work. She was, dumping her colleagues in it, all those sorts of things. But she had no choice. She was ill. She couldn't work. The right. problem is to say no, that's a choice you're making. You're choosing to put someone out. You're choosing to not be perfect or admit that you need a, to rest. You're choosing to make someone think maybe slightly badly of you because nobody likes to know, let's face it. And that choosing to do that knocks on your internal values, your internal sense of identity, internal sense of, I am always good at this. I mean, uh, I know American physicians work just as many hours as, as we used to in the, uh, when we were junior doctors, you know, I am someone who could work 120 hours a week. Therefore I can carry on. But if, if I'm ill or if I'm choosing to say, no, I'm going to go home after 10 hours, what does that mean for me? And so when we crash up against our internal values and our internal identity, you're right. It's not just guilt. We feel it's shame. It's, I am not enough. I am not good enough. And for somebody to choose to feel that shame is very difficult. It's one thing if you break your leg. I broke my ankle last in, in October. Yeah, I had to cancel stuff. I felt a bit guilty, but you know, it was out of my control. But if I'm choosing to do it, I would say that is almost impossible unless you have utterly changed the story in your head, the dialogue about who you are and, and, and what your identity is. Or you hit the wall, can't go on, and have to regroup. And don't, and remember too, you've got guilt and you've got shame. But there's also the third horseman. It's uh, imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. What if they find out? <laughs> that and all of these things are 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 
uh, legacies of our training and the programming of our medical mm -hmm. education, right? Workaholic, superhero, lone ranger, perfectionist. It's what we had to do to make it through. The challenge is when you graduated from your training program, you were actually free to do anything you want anywhere in the world. But we were so well programmed as residents that what we did was just look for another set of tracks to step onto and didn't recognize that, that we had made it through the finish line and we are now free. And again, if you're listening to this right now, you're free. You're free. I always talk to people. I can't, I can't not, I can't leave. I can't abandon my patients. I can't do this. I can't do that. Okay. Hang on a second. What would, what would happen at work if you got in a car wreck on the way to work tomorrow and broke your pelvis and you're out of action for three months? What would they do? Would the patients get seen? So I just want you to know most people, when they quit their job, <laughs> If they were to go back two weeks later, nobody's talking about you. Yeah, you okay. are not indispensable. <laughs> totally. You are not. Totally, totally. So, so that it, when you have that, I can't yeah. not see my patients. No, who's going to see the patients? Who's going to take care of my staff? That will freeze you in guilt and shame. But I'm telling you, it is a, it's a mirage. Mm. It's this and you have to step through that. Yeah. It's so interesting about choice. We feel so powerless, you know, for such an intelligent group of people, we could be really thick when it comes to, to choosing. And I know when I'm doing a, a, a training sessions, we talk about leaving, leaving the surgery, you know, a, we're not talking about leaving at four, four o'clock. We're not talking about leaving at half five. We're talking about leaving like at six, half six, seven o'clock, you know, and people just say, I have no control over when I leave. Really? So no control over when you leave. So who gets up and goes to your car and drives home then? Mm, well, okay, well, maybe that's me, but I just can't. Well, why can't you? Well, if there's like 20 urgents or extras to see, I just, I just have to see them. I just can't leave them. Well, what, you know, who, who, who says you can't? Well, well, I, well, I don't want to because what if, what if? I'm like, well, you are still choosing. And it's this sort of very, very helpless position we've got ourselves into of, I have no choice because the buck stops with me. And I mean, I can understand that. I mean, people say, well, if I don't do it, who, who is going to? But we always have a choice. People don't like it. People do not like it when you tell them they, they have a choice because that's confronting because it means they actually have to do something about it, don't they? And they can't stay in that, that, that victim role anymore. Well, if, if the choice has, is going this way, that's the trend and the choices that you make and, and you acknowledge it's a choice, that means that you can actually make a different mm -hmm. choice. I usually tell people, there's a saying I learned a long time ago, it goes like this, I teach people how to treat me. Mm. Oh, yeah. I teach people how to treat me. Yeah. And there's another one that goes with it that says this, you don't get what you want in life, you get what you tolerate. Mm. And that combined with, if you broke your pelvis, who would see these patients? Well, they obviously would get taken care of yeah. somehow. So if you're teaching people how to treat you, you only get what you tolerate and the people will be seen in your absence. If you can get somebody to intellectually um, understand and resonate with those statements, then it's a question of getting their body programming to work in a little bit different way. And, yeah. and I, I find that doctors are also motivated by just our, the nature of our personality that if we want, if we are thinking about changing something, doctors always contemplate changing the biggest thing possible. And that is, that also is intimidating yeah. and it, it increases your chance of failure. Yeah. So I, I ask them to pick their first new action step to be something so small, it's ridiculous. I mean, I can do that in the next 15 seconds. Okay, do it. Let's celebrate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about this sort of thing, you always get the comeback. But, you know, what if somebody genuinely might die? What if it's going to cause significant patient harm? That just seems to be the, the pushback that comes, that comes all the time. Um, you know, I, a webinar I did, I did a little poll. I think I mentioned this to you before, but I asked, why do you not say no to stuff? What stops you? And um, I got them to vote. Is it because of patient harm? Is it because they feel guilty or they're worried about what other people might think or it will cause someone inconvenience? Um, and only 3% said it was because of patient harm. 3%. So, so that's led me to say, well, you know what? If, if someone's going to die, 
don't do it. Choose to do something different. If someone is genuinely going to die because of that choice you're going to make, well, don't make that choice. You know, you can predict your consequences. But mostly, mostly it's because of our own internal stories and our uh, worry about what other people think. And I just, our, sh- our sheer obedience to the, to the system sometimes, right? Well, and, and I would say that um, when you're stressed, tend to think in black and white terms. There's no gray. There's no middle ground when you're stressed. Mm. And um, people will go to an extreme, right? Um, and, and what I usually talk about is the 80-20 rule. It's like, what would it be like for you to get home on time 80% of the time? Not all the time, because sometimes there is somebody out in the lobby that you need to take care of, or there would be an unfortunate outcome. But what if, you know, three days a week, let's just do 60%, three days a week, you get home within half an hour of what you consider to be on time. If we could make some changes that made that difference, would that fe- how would that feel to you? Mm-hmm. And they usually will soften up a little bit and say, oh, man, that'd be amazing. OK, well, let's not worry about never and always. Let's go for that 60 percent. See if we can hit that. That little bit. And what about just this, a little bit? What about this sort of thing about dumping on colleagues? Because I think that is a, a massive trigger for us in the UK, because if you don't if you don't do it, someone has got to do it. Someone has got to deal with this sort of un- unlimited demand and. And if I don't do it, then my colleague, who is almost equally as burnt out as me, is probably going to have to do it as well. Well, a lot of times uh, that call rotation, those those people who know that they're responsible for each other's patients don't talk to each other. So I, I believe that this sort of making healthy boundaries and uh, recognizing that we're a tribe of light workers taking care of a tribe of patients that if we coordinate our activities and meet outside, you know, if we have a support group that's local that we meet in, if we if we have a, a once a month get together where we have a pint and talk about cases and thank each other for covering for the time that you, you know, went to the coast or whatever, right? That if we start to do that kind of collaboration as practicing physicians, all sorts of things become possible. The only reason we operate as, you know, solo, um, uh, workaholic lone rangers, right, is because that's the way training was. You know, what do they call collaboration in medical school? Cheating. <laughs> so we're taught to not work with each other. Yeah. We're taught to disagree with each other, almost in a debate style, like a lawyer would, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And we do see that in, in, in GP practices. I've been in to do a bit of team coaching with the, the leadership team. And they're not a team. They're just a group of people working in separate rooms who, who get together and try and make some decisions in, in a ridiculously small amount of time. They've never even looked at how they work, okay. how, they, right. how they work as a team. They're individual gerbils on their own individual yeah. gerbil wheel yeah. in their own individual office. And they don't pat the only time they're outside the door, they, they pass each other like sh- ships in the night. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it, it's tough. I always say to people that looking to your very close colleagues for approval and and for them to go, no, don't worry, you go home, you're doing a great job. It's sometimes they're the wrong people to look to because they are under the same illusion as you. They're under the same pressure. So like you said, getting that network of people just slightly out of your practice right here, but people that also know what you're, you're experiencing, but but it's just a little bit removed. So if you go, if you go off, you're not dumping on them, you're dumping on somebody else, but they can just sense check stuff. And I think as doctors, we do not use those support networks well enough. And there's so many people around that you could be meeting with really, really regularly. I mean, we don't use them in our practices and we certainly don't use them outside our practices. Well, there's also sometimes a sense of resentment, right? So I spent so much time in this practice. Last thing I want to do is hang with a bunch of doctors, right? Mm-hmm. And it's escapist kind of stuff. But if you don't, there is a whole nother level of support and effectiveness available to you if you'll step towards your colleagues rather than step away. Mm-hmm. Now, here, what we would have is, for instance, the family practice department inside an organization would share each other's patients. So there's actually a collaborative covering relationship. So it would be a, you know, I'll have your back if you have mine kind of reciprocation that's available. Yeah. 
I guess in the, in the UK, with the, the sort of general practice that we have, it's sort of like whoever's on call mops up everything. Everyone else sees, sees their list and you're just just trying to get through the day, really. Um, I'm just interested in this sense of identity, though, that we get from going through these very, very competitive med school systems and how we help people to shift out of the job being being part of who they are into just something around it is a job because of course you don't want people to shift too far and it just become a a whole money-making thing but where what's the sort of the health the healthy way of doing it well i have several stages that i ask people to consider right so the default relationship with your career as a physician graduating from the education system is what i call all in Mm -hmm. Um, your identity is fused with your profession as a physician all of your time is spent in your practice. All of your money comes from there. Anytime you do any reading on your own, it's about stuff inside your practice, unless you're on vacation and have totally you know, kicked that to the curb. But all in means if there's any disappointments, if there's any overwork, if there's any um, uh, professional uh, conflict, if there's a patient who isn't liking what you're doing, because you're all in infused with that as your identity, it hurts even more. The seesaws are even worse. And the risk of overwhelm is literally 100%, 100%. I personally believe that the average doctor goes through burnout a couple of times in their career. Uh, not, not, there's nobody that gets out without going through burnout. Burnout is that point where you get so exhausted, you say, I'm not sure how much longer I keep going like this. And you make a change in your career. That's burnout that made you do that. So the first is all in. The second is what I call terrarium. So if you remember what a terrarium is, it's usually a 10 gallon fish tank with a lid and you make a little ecosystem in there and you can close the lid and it's self-contained. It doesn't need to be watered or anything like that. So a terrarium means put the lid on your practice, meaning go in, do a great job with your patients, do a great job with your documentation, and then get the heck out of there and don't have anything to do with anything medical until you come back again, right? Just like the old, the old thought process of let's go back to the coal miner. You would punch the clock and go to the pub, right? And you wouldn't talk about the coal mine. Mm-hmm. He's a coal miner, but he's only a coal miner but after he punches in and before he punches out, right? So terrarium. And then some people will do, and I don't know how popular this is in the NHS, but some people will actually terrarium their practice and then take on what they call a side gig So a little something on the side that they do because it's exciting and um, and perhaps thrilling, perhaps even a little income stream that is outside of what they usually get for their practice activities. So we got all in, terrarium, side gig, and then the last one would be some sort of transition out of being a practicing physician. Now, there are people, a lot of people, and a lot of wishful thinking about, I'm going to quit rent medicine. But I see very, 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 very few people actually doing that. There's a lot of aspirational talk and chatter on the internet about how I'm going to quit medicine. But it's very rare. It typically is a process. I'm one of the very few people who've been able to do it. That's how I know there. it's rare. I rarely talk to somebody who has been able to make the, um, what's the right word? the transition, the complete transition. And still all my patients are doctors. I'm still a doctor and all my patients are doctors at this point. And I use a little different technique, coaching and guided imagery and things like that in what I do. But being able to terrarium your practice, there's another stage in there called a bridge. So for instance, I'm gonna stop what I'm doing now and I'm gonna take a new position, but I don't see this position as my final, my final resting place, so to speak, this I'm taking it to get a break from what I have been doing. It's a bridge to someplace else. And this bridge is allowing me to support my family and practice my craft as I search, do a little better search for what will be my next practice where if everything's okay, I'll go all in there. Really interesting interesting stages but it's a conscious choice i'm going to have a relationship it's sort of like it's sort of sort of like 
uh, dating, who are you going to date? And it, if you're not infatuated with the person and it's a rational process of, you know, he makes good money and I really like him and he's fun and all that kind of stuff. You can decide who you're going to date kind of a thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. You say that. I mean, one of the reasons I ca- called my podcast "You Are Not a Frog" is because it's after that um, there was a study in the the BJGP about doctors leaving the NHS. If it was GPs under the age of fifty leaving the NHS, and and the reasons that they did it, um, there were all sorts of reasons. You know, like the admin load, um, they'd had a complaint or something. But by far the biggest reason was the effects on their well being. And in that um, article, they compared GPs to frogs in boiling water. You know, the, the, the workload has got slowly, slowly, very, very, very high. Um, and I guess with a frog, you, you've got two choices, haven't you? You either burn, burn to death in your, in your pan of boiling water, you burn out, or you get out. And those are the only two options that you've got. But I, I like what you've been saying about this sort of the, the, the income stream and the side hustle and, and all that sort of stuff, because I think... For me, the, the secret of, of really working well as a doctor is to have some diversification in your, in your work. Uh, I, I was talking to someone who has come over from another country to keep her practice up to date. Um, and she had to sort of retrain. She's just done six weeks in a GP surgery. And um, she was doing, I think, six or seven sessions a week. And she said, there is no way she could sustain that <laughs> just having done it for six weeks compared to how it was 10 years ago. You know, there's no way you can do that, that full time because you would <laughs> burn out on the spot. And I think people are, are realizing that and the people that are doing well are the people that are getting that diversification, that sort of side hustle. And, and, and within the NHS, the great thing is you can find other roles. So you can be like a training program director or you can sit on the college council or you can go into a bit of research or you can do teaching or there's loads of different stuff that you can do within within your job. But then that carries a little bit of a health warning as well because whilst I say diversification, great, because it helps you use a different bit of your brain, it gets you a different team, all that. What I see happening is people go, yeah, no, I'd like to do something else. So I'll take on that role and they don't drop anything. And then I'll take on this right. role, and they don't right. stop any of their more roles. And suddenly, they might only be doing, I don't know, four sessions a week as a doctor, but they've got 20 other roles. And they're wondering right. why they're never getting a time off. And all they've done is replace one problem with another problem. Well, and that's, again, where you need to have the ability to consciously plan and create this. So mm-hmm. one of the things that I showed you is my little picture of a doctor in a whirlwind, Yeah, yeah, yeah. right? One of the things that doctors need to do is to take some time, and I say weekly, weekly, a few, just a few minutes to work on your practice and not in it, mm-hmm. to step out of the whirlwind of your practice and look at your roles and responsibilities, your energy level, your satisfaction. Look at those things because, again, if the patient comes first, where do I become? I come Don't say second because it's last. Okay. (laughs) So a lot of times there's even guilt and shame around me asking you the question on a scale of zero to 10, how satisfied are you with your practice over Mm -hmm. the last couple of weeks? I mean, that can even be blocked by that patient comes first programming. But I ask that question to a lot of people, everybody I meet, right? So let's ask it. Scale of zero to 10. 10 being couldn't be any better, zero meaning it couldn't be any worse. What's your level of satisfaction with your practice, whatever that is? You may have part leadership position, part Mm -hmm. clinical, it may be all clinical, whatever is your practice over the last couple of weeks. What's your satisfaction score? Zero to 10. What is it? Write it down. Write it down and put today's date next to it. Because potentially, if you want to change things, this is a starting point. Now, close your eyes, take a breath. Open your eyes and look at that number. Are you okay with that number? Or would you like it to be, let's say, half a point higher? Because you can do that. However, you would need to plan it because you're already overwhelmed. You need to plan it. Ideally, you'd need to stop doing a few things to clear some room out so that you could maybe start doing one one different thing. Take baby steps, right? And always be pointing towards what you consider to be your ideal practice. And if you say, you know, I really like treating kids with ADD, ADHD, and if I put the word out to my colleagues in the community, maybe I could see, you know, one in six of my patients in my practice would be ADHD. And I say, well, how, how would that feel? It's like, oh my, that'd be amazing. Okay, great. 
What's the first step in that? (laughs) Not the biggest step. The first step. Because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. So you got to do something new. And the challenge is you get so tired and overwhelmed by just keeping up with your current habits that it almost seems like you're stuck, but you're not. You have to have to step out of the whirlwind, though. Yeah. And do some planning. You have to work on your practice, not just in it. Yeah. It's interesting you say that. Literally just yesterday I was recording a podcast about, you know, what, what's your flight plan? What is your flight plan for your life? And Flight plan. There you go. Yeah. Well, it was just based on the fact I got on this plane and um, it, it was uh, coming from a holiday last year. And the pilot got on. We were all just about to go and the pilot got on the, the uh, tenor and said, well, we are just going to go, but we just filed our flight plan and it's very different from the flight plan that was filed a week ago by the airline. And we just got to work out what's going on. And about 15 (laughs) minutes later, they came back and so lucky they checked because they said, ah, we found out the problem. Uh, Someone else filed this flight plan for us and they forgot to add any passengers. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So they said, we're going to Dusseldorf. Yeah. You thought you were going yeah, someplace they said, else. So literally, we've not got enough fuel to fly home. We, we can't actually fly. So we now have to wait two hours to be refueled and then blah, blah, yada, yada, yada. It just sorry, carried wow. on. But I was like, oh my gosh, that is such a good analogy for life, isn't it? You know, doctors do not file their own flight plans. They let someone else do it. And then they don't check if they've got enough fuel to get to where they want to go. And um, we end up just being at someone else's beck and call because we, we, we don't... We don't look at what we, want, what we want to do. But when he just said, you know, we are too overwhelmed to even do it, I think you've hit the nail on the head. When I first started talking about well-being a few years ago, you know, I was thinking, right, well, I, I want to go and do some more training and I, I love coaching and I can go and talk about well-being. I went into a, a bunch of lawyers and I did a lunchtime session on well-being and they just looked at me as if I was completely mad. And I said, Right. This, is, this isn't landing very well. What, what's going on? They said, oh, well, everything you're saying is great, you know, but we have no time. There's and a, impossible. We, we, have to, <laughs> we have to reply to an email within 30 seconds of it coming in. Oh, 30, oh my. I was like, that can't be true because, like, how do you go to the bathroom, right? But, and so that was the first time I went, ah, oh, right, okay. Well-being is connected to time. Uh, you can't be well if you haven't got any time. Time if you, ha- if you haven't got enough time, you can't just do more. You've got to say no to stuff. Time is then connected to this whole mindset and back, back, back you go till it gets to mindset. So yeah, it's really, really impossible to even think about making a change or diversifying your career or planning or putting a flight plan in if you're completely overwhelmed and knackered and exhausted. Well, and I'll, I'll say one last thing just to set the stage and then I've got to run. Um, if you are inside a bureaucracy, be it a governmental bureaucracy or a business bureaucracy, and someone else has the ability to control anything about your work environment, they will always send you new orders that are additive to what you're doing now. I've never ever seen anybody send out a memo that asks people to stop doing something. They always ask you, we're doing another quality uh, initiative. You need to do six more keystrokes and five clicks on every patient that has this diagnosis. In order, it's always additive. And I personally believe that one of the things that's caused this crest in the burnout rate is that we are at a last straw moment for a lot of people. They are literally, the chaos and overwhelm of the day is literally has them on, on fumes, mm-hmm. right? And it could be that the next missive that makes me do just three more clicks a day drives me over the edge and out. Um, So whenever you're planning something different about your practice, my encouragement is always to look for what you can quit Mm. first. Mm. I could quit doing this and it wouldn't make any difference. That's a great place to start. And here there's actually a name for that. It's called a gross project. Get rid of stupid stuff. (laughs) Oh, I love that. I'm and that. across your practice, what you could do is get your partners and your and your team of employees together and say, here's a suggestion box. Write down an idea for something we could stop doing it. It wouldn't make any difference. Put it in the suggestion box. And, and the smallest number of suggestions I've ever seen when somebody runs one of these contests for a couple of weeks is like 40. 
but it's, it's wow. by stopping those things that are not necessary that you clear the space for potentially taking a new action or two that'll get you more of what you want. That'll affect that number in your satisfaction score. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that. Get rid of stupid stuff. Because often when we're talking about, you know, time management, prioritizing, people go, well, there is nothing. There's nothing I do that's not important. <laughs> I have to do everything. Like, yeah, but you can't do everything. So how, how are you going to square that with reality? Because <laughs> reality is always going to win, isn't it? So, I'm conscious of time, Dyke. On my podcast, I normally end just with three top tips. So if you had three top tips, what would they be for people? Give yourself a score for your satisfaction. Put a date next to it. Ask yourself if you're okay with that. I am old school. Grab a journal every weekend for 15 minutes and journal about your experience of your practice that week. You can't journal from inside your whirlwind. And if you want things to be different than, the, than what they are, um, I'm going to give you this bias. Look for something you can stop doing that's really not making a difference or an important difference. You begin to clear some space. And uh, uh, I'll give you a fourth. When you come home from work, as your hand touches the doorknob on your front door, take a huge breath in and let go of everything that doesn't need to come into the house with you. Mm. <laughs> Maybe even flutter lips. <laughs> <laughs> shake it off. Shake it off. Yeah. Shake it shake off. It you off. got it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Well, my, my top tips would be you are not your job. Find your identity in something else. Um, and, you know, if someone's going to die, choose something different. Always know that you can choose. You can choose to do something different if you if you want to. So just because you've set one boundary doesn't mean it's forever. And you can you can choose. You're in control. And the finally, for me, it's watch that story that you're telling yourself in your head. Watch those. I should. I ought to. It's it's bad if I don't, I'm a bad person, all that. If we could get rid of that, that self-talk, we're, we're half the way to solving all these, all these problems. Right on. It's been wonderful chatting with you. And you. We're on both sides of the pond. Yeah. Are you going to come over to the UK at all then? Well, I hope so. Yeah. Lemington College for Boys, Lemington Spa in Warwickshire is where I got my own. Oh, there we go. There we go. Well, maybe we can we can get you over and we could do we could do some sort of um, event where we get people together who really want to nail this. Right. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Oh, it's been wonderful to talk to you. Thank you for your time. You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Brilliant. And um, we'll, we'll put the links um, of how you can get to both of us in, in, in the show notes for for, for all yep. of that and I'm sure we've got the, I know you've got loads of resources we've got loads of resources so it's been wonderful connecting with you and, and, and let, let's have another podcast soon because I think we may probably just scratch the surface of, what of course so Drummond and Morris Morris and Drummond right love it love M it MD Mad Dog Mad there we dog. go Mad Dog Morris and Drummond <laughs> yes both sides of the pond have a great day you, you everybody keep first. breathing cheers like, see you soon bye <laughs> thanks for listening don't forget we provide a self-coaching CPD workbook for every episode. You can sign up for it by the link in the show notes. And if this episode was helpful, then please share it with a friend. Get in touch with any comments or suggestions at hello at youarenotafrog.com. I love to hear from you. And finally, if you're enjoying the podcast, please rate it and leave a review wherever you're listening. It really helps. Bye for now. <laughs>